Yo, my brother, how you doing? Can you hear I'm me? I'm pretty good. Yeah, man, I'm loving the style, my brother. How you doing, man? So you're I'm pretty good. White, which looks beautiful, and I'm wearing black, which, you know, you know, it's all good. It's nice, nice contrast. <laughs> How, How you, you been? doing? How you been? You been alright? Because obviously we've we've tried for a long time to do this interview. Yeah, man. Life keep life, and everything yeah. keep happening, and and you know it's. But we here today, and I'm glad about that. So. Yeah, man, definitely. Yes, and I want to give a big thanks to you for making it, obviously, and also yeah, to Darren Darby, because Darren Darby is a, a lovely guy, man. How do you know Darren Darby anyway? Man, it's a funny story how I met Darren. Uh, we actually met on Facebook. Uh, it was about maybe uh, 2012, 2011. Mm-hmm. I was having brain surgeries, man, and they gave me – it, it was rough. And wow. I, I, was, I, reached out, I reached out to Darren, and I was like, you know, I'm having brain surgery, but I want to I wanna do a show in Florida. Mm-hmm. And he said, you you get through your brain surgery and you recover, and we'll, we'll put something together. And he kept his word. So wow. that was like my first show back from, you know, brain surgeries. And uh, that's how I met Darren, man, through a hope and a dream on Facebook. <laughs> wow, amazing. Yeah, so that's Fantastic. how we met. Yeah, I can imagine that Darren saw your talent and thought, you know what, he's got to support you in some way. Because he seems to be the kind of character that likes to support people, help people along their way and stuff, which I think is quite yeah. admirable. Amazing. Yeah, definitely, man. He's been the biggest supporter. Like, um, mm-hmm. I would say, uh, like, when we first started doing the show, that, that show that we did, Actually, his brother uh, recorded the show, and he was like, you know, I'm writing a stage play, mm-hmm. and uh, i love for you to be in it. So, you know, through Darren, I was able to do, like, what was like five or six gospel stage plays Okay, uh, with his brother. So he definitely stayed at his parents' house. They treated me like family. So it was it was love from the beginning. Yes, That's sir. Right. Yeah, man, it's good, it's good, it's good stuff. Well, obviously, you've got to go into the topic at hand because you are a comedian. Yes, sir. Okay. So I don't, I don't know, I'm not asking you to tell any jokes right now, obviously, but you are a comedian. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things I, I, when I, because you sent me that video of you on, on it's on YouTube, but you did a show mm-hmm. what's called uh, Funny But Not Famous. Funny, yeah, Funny Not Famous. It aired on uh, yeah. Afro TV, which mm-hmm. is Xfinity Comcast channel. Mm hmm. It should be funny, yes, but sir. Famous because you're not or not yet famous. Because seriously, those guys and yourself, you guys are incredible. I'm going to share that stuff, man. You Thank guys you. are so funny, very so funny. But one of the things I found, yeah. topics, one of the topics you covered was about getting your ass whooped. You know, getting your ass whooped by your parents or whatever it was. And I'm saying, what is it about? <laughs> what is it with? Because my I got my ass whooped as well. What is it about black people? We always why are we always whooping our kids' asses? I don't know what it's about. It's like a thing we just seem to be. <laughs> You know, we seem to just like, yeah, what is it, man? <laughs> in the black community, it's customary that when you whoop your child, yes, white people, I said whoop your child. And with every lick you give that child, it comes with a word, correct? When my mama whooped me, I knew exactly what I did. I could not dispute that butt whooping. Didn't I tell you? To clean your room. Yeah, you sure did. You sure, you sure did. I remember. I deserve this. I deserve this. Remember? Y'all, my uncle babysitted me one time, and he tried to whoop me, and he stuttered real, real bad. That joker hit me 32 times on didn't I? He grabbed the bell. He was like, dit, 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 I said, wait a minute. I'm not going to be able to dress out for PE tomorrow. Now, you've been whooping me for 14 minutes, and I don't even know what I've done. Now you're gonna have to beat me in braille, cause this is some bull. Hey, spell the rise for the child. You know, life. My mom always taught me that mm. life gonna hit you harder than I'll ever hit you. So, mm. <laughs> but hey. it's one of those things where my mom, she didn't just like 
come in there and knock you out. Like she mm. she told you why she was doing it and she warned you before she would do it. So yeah, yeah. you had the choice, you know. <laughs> but I, I think like now we live in a society where gentle parenting and you know, you wanna it don't work for everybody. It don't. So <laughs> I would rather, my mom told me, she said, I would rather discipline you now this way so you can understand. And, and then when you grow up and life is beating you up or you're looking aggressive, she had her reasons. And mm -hmm. for me growing up now and the era that I did in the 80s to now, I definitely see the difference in, in, in how we respect our parents, how we treat our parents, how we, mm -hmm. like, my mom never heard me curse, mm -hmm. even as an adult before she passed away. She never, never, you know, just, it was that respect thing. Now I hear kids talking to their parents like their brother and sister, so. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> yeah. We've got the same, we've got the same, not, it's more than called an issue. We've got the same thing going on in the UK. You know, just times have changed, actually have changed. But I don't mm -hmm. think you mentioned your mum. You mentioned, your mum said that, she said that you were going to be, she knew you were going to be a comedian. Yeah. Okay. So would you say that basically people are, are born funny? Well, my mom was no. my mom was a comedian in her own right, so okay. I think I got it honest. My mom on her side of the family was a comedian. Mm. My dad on his side of the family was the comedian, but they had two different styles. My mom was very mm. quick hitter, like uh, you know that that was true. That was her exact reaction. You know, so my dad is more of that funny storyteller, animated, have the whole family rolling. So. I think that's where my styles come from is a clash between both of them. Mm -hmm. But that she she was a a, a quick witted, serious one line comedian herself, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Hmm. so when did you know that you were funny though? Did when did you kind of was it at school? Was you like did you take would you like taking a mick out of somebody else? Was someone taking a mick out of you? You know, like in England, well, what we do, we take we <laughs> always like what happened? We used to roast each other, you know. Someone yeah. that was we roast someone about what they were wearing or something, or we roast them about their mom, which is awful now. But that's what we did. So when did you realize? I realized that when I talked myself out my first butt whooping. Mm. You know, I like my mom. She was because I had a young mom. My mom was like 16, 17 when she had me. So I grew mm. up with that young mm. mom. Mm. And when she got that belt, I just started talking noise, and she started laughing. <laughs> So that, that, like, I was like, okay, that I made my mom laugh. That's because she was always so serious, you know. Mm. And then for my grandmother, like, uh, she was on bed rest growing up when I was growing up. So I used to just imitate, you know, her favorite wrestlers or comedians or or whatever, to, just to get a laugh out of her. And I felt like if I could make her laugh, I can make anybody laugh. So, mm -hmm. of course, you're right. That transferred over to school. You know, we'd have our roasting sessions and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And uh, so, yeah, that actually helped out having mm -hmm. having parents that had a sense of humor, mm -hmm. having an older cousin. My cousin Lamont was hilarious. And 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 uh, he was like my first roasting buddy. Like we would we would just find ways to entertain each other, whether it was beatboxing in the corner or whatever. It was me and him growing up. So it that helped. Good, good. But can you study to be a comedian, though? Because obviously. Is it something that has to be natural? Can you or can you study to be one? Do you believe? What do you believe? I mean, as far as the, the art of comedy itself, anybody can do it. It's the confidence mm -hmm. that you have. Yeah, you got to put in work because it's, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, but at the same time, you got to have that passion. And I mm -hmm. think more of the comedy, you can, you can study, they teach class, you can learn, but as far as timing, you know, the material, that just takes practice and time. Mm. You know, because I, I have a joke that I may have wrote like five years ago, but I just now perfected it with another joke that I wrote. And I look back like, oh, this will go with this. And it's just doing that same joke over repetitive and, and, and learning the timing of it all. Okay, so timing's everything. So the timing, timing, of, with, timing so is just everything. Knowing what, the, knowing what the audience is thinking at that time and yeah. just being able to say the right thing at the right time. Is it about... You know, kind of like holding back certain lines as well, holding it back that's kind of the moment for when the community, sorry, the, where the audience are going to react to it. Yeah, I mean, for me, with my style of comedy, I'm in your face. I don't hold back as, you know, as, as to say, you know, I tell you the truth. 
Mm-hmm. But I also, in my story, I make you think. That is the whole issue of it because I feel like the funny comedy is what you can relate to. Uh, so your material, it don't, it don't even have to be funny. It's just what can the crowd relate to? It's 2023. There's some things that we need to stop doing. Like inviting me over to your house and tell me to take off my shoes and your carpet already dirty. <laughs> Is there some things we need to stop doing as black people? I go in my homeboy house. I said, man, what, what's up? He said, we just had a baby take his shoes off. I looked at his carpet. I said, what for? <laughs> if I take off my shoes to walk on your carpet, that means I'm going to take off my socks to walk in my shoes. I don't even want to be here that bad. I just leave. I come back. We can sit out on the patio. One is knowing your crowd, knowing the type of audience that you have, mm. knowing the city that you're performing in. Like before I do a show, I study the city. I know what streets wow. are the rough streets. I know what wow. schools are the bad schools. And I incorporate that just because it brings them in and it, it, it makes the audience relate to what I'm saying. Wow. wow. So I can't take Tampa jokes to, to Georgia. They don't know, you know, so I learn where I'm performing at in Georgia. Or I, so it's a lot that goes into it. Wow. Uh, but it's, for a me proper, it's a proper I, art then, isn't it? It's a proper art for me. It's, it's, yes. it's a form of study in some regard. Yes. I look at I look at it like the Temptations. The, the Temptations they were known for their moves, their precision. Mm. That's the same approach that I have to comedy. Mm. And one of my favorite comedians, Bernie Mac, said something that I live by to this day. He mm. said, "It's not what you say; it's how you say it." Yeah, exactly. So mm. I learned in my delivery to use my facial expressions, my hands, my movements. Everything is. I got a. I got a big like. I would say eight foot mirror that I practice in front of. I practice my movements, my mannerisms, how wow. how I'm gonna move, make my face. Mm. So it's not, you know, even with the timing and just knowing my jokes. So Brilliant. I practice all of that. It's it's not just something you go on stage. You no, know, it's hours and hours of practicing, mm. watching old footage, recording myself, and because I don't do the open mic, you know. No, that's really good to know because a lot of people look at these comedians and think, no, that's really easy. You know, you're going up there, you're just saying a few words for a couple of hours and then you're getting paid stupid money. Yeah. You know, it's like <laughs> musicians are sitting there practicing for years on their guitars, their instruments, and do you know what I mean? And they're not getting paid mm-hmm. nowhere near as much as some of these comedians. It takes a long time to get, I'm 14 years in and I'm still making 56, 70, $80 shows. Mm, mm, so, mm. I, I mean, I invest in producing my own shows to cover mm. for that, but mm. it, it, it takes a while to put yourself in a position where you can say, hey, I need this amount of money. Because mm. uh, as you see, they're not booking funny anymore. They booking popular. Yeah. Okay. So it can be funny all you want, but if you're not popular, you're not stepping foot in these clubs. Mm. Um, so that's one of the issues that like older generation comedians like myself are, are having. Mm. Uh, I'm not really big on social media. I don't really care for social media, but that's what the game is coming to. Mm. So it, it it's an art. It's just like, uh, you know, we practice and practice and practice for that five minute set, just like a musician. So yeah. it's, it's no different. That was one thing me and Darren was talking about, you know, because he's a DJ. He practiced and practiced and practiced for a set. And yeah, we make it look easy, but people don't understand the hours. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. You know, those, those three hour car rides for five minute sets. <laughs> so, so, so it's nice to cover it now. That's the whole point. I wanted people just to get an idea, a sense of what comedians do. But also a little bit about America and the differences and the mindsets to understand a bit more about you and the culture and social, you know, issues that you come up against. Benny, so, uh, so going back to the questions again, so how important is comedy? For me personally, I have some shirts that call comedy is the best medicine. Because I feel like, 
laughter is like the best medicine you can have when you're going through stuff. Because I feel like, you know, when I was going through my deal, if I could laugh through it, I can get through it. Mm. Uh, you know, for that brief moment at a comedy show, mm. it doesn't matter what you're going through. It means nothing. You in that moment, you having fun, you enjoying yourself. So I do feel like comedy can save your life. It saved my life. Like literally, I was rock bottom, suicidal, and comedy pulled me out of everything. Mm. So I think comedy to the world, if people learn how to laugh more and stop being so serious, the world can get back on track. Mm. Yeah. So I, I really, I really believe that. I truly live by that. I stand by it. I, I'm a witness to it. I'm a survivor of it. And um, that's one of the things that I love about comedy. No matter how bad you're hurting, it'll make you forget about it. So Yeah, yeah, but I hear you. I absolutely hear you. So would you say it's, it's as important as uh, music? Music is one of those things. Music and comedy. Yeah. I mean, if you ask a comedian, the hardest part of their job or, or, or getting ready for a show, they'll tell you, like, I spend more time on picking out the song that I'm coming out to. Mm -hmm. Like most, like comedians, most of them use and use music in their set. Uh, most of them uh, make jokes just to use certain songs. So I think it's one in the same. Mm -hmm. Music got a chance to put you in a spot where you where you 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 just feel invincible. But the only difference is music. You can be cleaning your house, listening to music and get into your song and you just forget the world. Comedy actually forces you to sit down and listen. And I think that is what social media has stolen from us, what COVID stole from us, the ability to just sit down and, and enjoy something. So, but it's all one and the same. Yeah, but it's gonna come back, man. It's gonna come back. The people are coming out again, getting out again, especially in London. We're getting out to the clubs again, we're getting out to the watch live music again. With plus mm -hmm. the view, we are doing what we can to encourage people to get back out and support artists yes. and everything else. Because we know we know that that's the livelihood, you know, yes. of, of, and that's to lose that art form is unbelievable. You can't we can't even imagine losing the art form. It's like you're gonna get a lot of these computerized music music, you know, AI music now. But you can't get you can't get AI comedy. Do you know what I mean? You, you, they can't happen. So I think you're gonna be fine to be fair. And 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 to be honest with you, like even recorded comedy is not the same as live comedy. Hmm. Because I can go and give a set and I feel like, oh, man, I just had the house in the palm of my hands. And then I'll go watch the recording and I'm like, I could have done better. Like, oh, yeah, it doesn't yeah. capture yeah. What, mm. what happened, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey. But I definitely get it. But they say, but going back to what you said about how it was, you know, really rejuvenating for you, comedy and stuff like that. But they, there are people, there are statements out there that say that comedians are the most depressed people. You know, if you look at Robin Williams. Is that a true statement that comedians are some of the most depressed people? I would say, yeah, I mean, I feel like being a comedian, it has its downfalls because nobody takes you serious. Mm. You know, when you are trying to be serious or they, they, everybody has their idea of a comic. Mm. Like I can't talk about certain topics around certain friends because they don't take me serious. They think everything's a joke. Mm. But I have, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, 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 you're a comedian, man. You just, you just making it. No, I'm really oh, serious no, right no, now. No. Uh, but yeah, I do I feel that. like, I do feel like we are like the last defense of freedom of speech that we have. Mm. And when you look at comedians today, it's it's getting harder because of the cancel culture and mm. and things like that. Yeah, we have freedom of speech, but you still need to be careful what you say because your speech does have consequences. Mm. And I think I think people are, are are getting more sensitive, which makes the job more hard. You know, you got to because, you know, if you look at it and think about Eddie Murphy back then versus what they would do to Eddie Murphy today. Mm. Yeah, cool. See, it wouldn't be yeah. the stuff that he said, the stuff he said. It, it, especially, <laughs> yeah, especially the, the, the gay jokes and things like that. You never get yeah. yeah. So I, I, I feel like I feel like it's changing, but I also feel like we just need to keep speaking our mind and speaking the truth. Hmm. 
And uh, but, 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 yeah, but, but, but the thing is, sorry to cut you there. Why why would that be an issue? I mean, if I was gay, I wouldn't have a problem with people taking a mickey at me. If I'm straight, I've got no problem taking a mickey at me. Why? You don't have to even ask this question. You know, it's life. We've got to be able to laugh at ourselves. Uh, for me, uh, for me, like I said, I, I don't care one way or the other. Mm. Uh, you know, I, me personally, I treat people like people. Mm. But at the same time, I understand, uh, like like Bernie said, it ain't what you say, it's how you say it. Mm. Mm. Uh, two, if it's disrespectful, I don't, I don't tolerate that disrespect regardless. So I can see some people getting offensive if it's disrespectful, but like you said, coming at people for telling the truth or, or just because you don't agree with what they're saying, if you deliver a message to me and it's not disrespectful or it's not causing harm to me or my family, you know, I'm okay with that. Say what you got to say. Those mm. are your words. But I, like I said, I just think I think the society has gotten very sensitive and I, I don't even know what to say about it other than people just need to mind their business. For one, mm. uh, <laughs> people need to stop uh, being so uptight and tense. Not everything is disrespect. Uh, the truth in this society has become hard to swallow. So people tend to run from it. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just me and my my opinion about it. I have no ill feelings either way. I just think people are people. And if you're treating people with respect, you wouldn't have these problems. Yeah, of course. Cool. Yeah. So we go back to the, to the question about the press being depressed as a comedian. Why why can't comedians just laugh at their own jokes? I mean, if you're like if you're a comedian and like, you know, you know, you need to make yourself laugh, just laugh at your own jokes. You know, why would why should they be depressed? Well, I mean, if you look at like you said, if you look at uh, comedians, we are, like you said, the most depressed people because we've all been through something. Mm. If you look at some of the greatest comedians ever, they've all been through something. They all have a dark past, a pain, or like... So it's a, so it's a, cope, so it's a coping mechanism, yeah. man. Coping it, for me, for I can't speak for all comedians, but for me, it was definitely a coping mm. mechanism. Mm. Uh, the guys in my circle is definitely a coping mechanism. Mm. Um, you can't change it. You can't, you can't. So yeah, it's a way to get it off. Not everybody can afford therapy. Mm. So it's a yeah, way to get it. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Hey. <laughs> it's a way to get it off your chest and, mm. and, and be there. Like, like I said, you never know who is in that mm. audience going through the same thing as you. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why I don't, I don't really talk about the crowd. Mm. I use I use the crowd in an uplifting manner if I have to, but you never know who's out in that audience. You know, mm. I've seen people that were very sick that wanted to just come out to a comedy show. They don't need to be talked about. Mm. You're talking about this lady wig. She may just finish her last round of chemo and lost all her hair. Mm. So for me, uh, like I said, I think everybody has a story, but comedians are some of the best people that learn how to tell their story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I look. I I consider everybody, you know, whether black or white, a brother or sister. This is how I look at life. Okay. Huh. So, but yeah. So I'm gonna ask you about this now. Were you ever influenced by white comedians? You know, people like Robin Williams, Will Ferrell, <laughs> Jim Carrey. Were you ever influenced by them? I just want to say the world did not deserve Robin Hare, Rob Robin Williams. Hmm. That man was a a, a genius just from everything, just the way he lived his life, the way he treated people. And unfortunately it wasn't until after he passed away that I started reading more into him and the mm -hmm. things that he did and, and some of the stuff that, you know, I was, my mouth was wide open. Mm -hmm. um, uh, growing up, I, you know, I grew up in Mississippi. We didn't really have uh, <laughs> much. Mm -hmm. So it, it wasn't really, it was a, basically segregated. Mm. I really didn't have the influence of white comedians. I grew up with, you know, my family had the Moms Mabel tapes and mm. Red Fox and, you know, Richard Pryor. It wasn't until I got older that I mm. uh, started listening to the white comedians and studying them. When I, you know, I moved to Ohio and that, because at first I just wanted to write, mm. but then I started studying com com comedians and, and, and 
just that crossover fact that Chris Rock had and stuff like that. Dave Chappelle, what made them great back in the time. I was like, man, white people really love them. Mm. So that was my introduction into learning mm. about the crossover, studying more white comedians to see how the difference and, and things mm. like that. I often find that that with black comedian themes, they're always around race. Why is that? Why is it you always see black comedians, you know, the themes that they use are always around race. You know, around race. You mentioned something about segregation. I think that's a lot of the stuff that being in the South. So when you mm -hmm. say it, I do, and I realize, I realize where you where you actually grew up. And I think, gosh, you know, living in those kind of situations where you're segregated, it must have a huge impact. It, it has a it has an impact of hmm. everything actually because if you if you think about it, I was raised by the generation, you know, from the from the civil rights era. I was raised by that generation, so I got to see it firsthand growing up in Mississippi. Uh, I got to see what racism really was at an early age to help me understand. And then I ended up moving up north and it was just like a totally different vibe. Mm. Like, I, you know, I saw my first interracial couple and I'm like, what's going on here? You know, so it, it was definitely a culture shock. Mm. But I think race. Um, I think race is widely used by everyone, mm. not just the black comedians using race. Uh, there everywhere I go. It's a it's a topic. Uh, you you got the black comedians that how they say talk white or use the white jokes, and you got the white comedians that grew up with black people like Gary Owens and stuff like that. So race has always been a topic. They kind of, but they always they always comparing the differences into exactly what they black people behave like this, black people eat this, white people eat that. It's quite exactly. I mean, I have some jokes where I I, I uh why talk about the difference in the cultures from what, from my own perspective, uh, certain things, different cultures. But at the end of the day, people are genuinely curious about it because it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's one of those topics where it's a different vibe when a comedian's on stage telling you his perspective as someone at a dinner table or being out in public. Mm -hmm. You're more comfortable listening to it and like, oh yeah, yeah and laughing about it as opposed to being at a dinner table around a group and people are like, oh, oh, well, they talking about this or they talking about that, you know? Uh, so I, I think it's one of those things that is going to be around for a long time. And it's, and it's kind of, is it like what people are thinking about right now, but they're just not willing to say it kind of thing. And the comedian says what they're thinking kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah. I'll say some stuff and I'll just be joking and it'd be true. And then people become like, man, you know, I had that same experience last week. Mm. Or they notice someone in their job and they'd be like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> mm -hmm. when, when, when Steve Harvey was talking about um, how black people take their breaks and how white people take their breaks. That is true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when yeah. I go on my break, I'm trying to get that extra five, ten minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. but, so. That that is very true, but mm. you, you know we live in that society now where things that we could talk about freely back then we can't talk about anymore. So basically, you're saying that some of these stereotypes are actually true. Stereotypes. There's a reason for those stereotypes. I, for me personally, yeah, I definitely think most of the, some of the stereotypes are true. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna be honest with you. <laughs> I'm, and some of the stereotypes are true. Mm. Wherever you go, it's gonna be a stereotype. Yeah, I get it. So who's your who's your who's your best comedian right now? Who is the greatest? So you who would say is the greatest comedian right now? You know what? In the world. I don't I can't say in the world because I ain't been all over the world yet. <laughs> I, I I I'll tell you for for me personally right now, uh Everybody here going to tell you Dave Chappelle, he's the hottest. Dave Chappelle, you know, Kevin Hart, Chris Rock because of all that. But I don't even watch them guys anymore, man. Honestly, I watch the up-and-coming comedians, the guys that I saw grind from the beginning, like the Marvin Hunters, the Carlos Millers, 
like these guys that I, I I started like at the same time as them, and I saw them just like progress, and and now they're just taking over the world, just selling out shows everywhere. Those those are the guys that are great to mm. me. Okay. So mm. yeah, yeah. But look as far as the hottest, say, 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 say the name again. Uh, one of my favorite comedians, Marvin Hunter. You got Carlos Miller. Mm. Uh, they based in Atlanta right now. Those guys are funny. Mm. Uh, that was probably like two of my top comedians right now. Uh, Carlos is one of the guys from the uh, 85 South show. Uh, mm. And uh, Marvin, he's been on a lot of TV shows. He he mainly travels with Ricky Smiley. Okay. Uh, those, those are like some of the guys that I just really admire. Uh, big fan of Trevor Noah. I'm a big fan of him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very and, intelligent uh, guy. Very intelligent guy. Yeah. Very obviously, intelligent. Yeah, I, mean, I don't agree with everything he says, but he's got such a but he thinks everything he says, because he's got such a power base, that's it. You know, he just, you know, you can't really say anything against him because he's got such a power base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he got his own little Beyonce beehive going on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, what can you do? It's like, yeah, he's from Kardashians. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Trevor yeah, Noah's. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it, it's one of those things, like you said, I, I don't agree with everything a comedian says, but at the same time, I respect that intelligence. You can tell that he's working mm. on his craft. You can tell, you, you just can, you know, when somebody is walking in their purpose. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like yeah. like Dave Chappelle, mm. man, it, that man can say what he want to say, but at the same time, it's how he says it. He's very, very intellectual and very intelligent when he speaks and everything is carefully you know, <laughs> it's like, what can you say? He said everything well. <laughs> well, talking about Dave Chappelle, uh, I've got a question there. He mm -hmm. talks about his issues with transsexuals. Uh -huh. Does he do that just to get attention, do you think? Me personally, I don't think Dave Chappelle can need to say anything for attention. Mm. I, you know, uh, and as far as that, I mean, if you look at his latest special, he had a, a transsexual on tour with him. Mm. And uh, he had a he had a, um it, it's in the paper you can Google it. Mm -hmm. I don't remember uh, her name, but he had a transsexual with him that ended up killing herself mm -hmm. because her own community was bashing her because she was. Oh yeah, I have seen some. Yeah, I did. No, no, I know. Yes, exactly. He had a good relation. I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I watched yeah, that. definitely covered. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, like mm. say, I, that man ain't got to say nothing for attention. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so basically, people have taken it the wrong way, you think, and they're just trying to find a way to dig at him. Exactly. Yeah, so they're trying to create, create controversy around him to try to cancel him somehow. Exactly, because that, mm. like I said, Dave is one of planned out. He don't just speak to speak. Mm. Even in his comedy special, he's not trying to be funny at all. Mm. If you watch his special, he is he is talking to you and he's very you serious. Real. Yeah, he's he's, yeah, he's he's exactly he's trying to hurt you if anything, upset you if anything. Yeah, he's he looking at y'all like, <laughs> why are y'all laughing? I'm trying mm. to tell. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, mm. I think that was blown way out of proportion and mm. and, and things like that. Okay, so. brilliant. Do you think comedy will ever get to the point where you don't have to talk about color anymore, just to get the, just to get a rise out of people? I think honestly, it's never going to stop because it doesn't start with comedy. Mm. I think I, it's it's embedded in our DNA. Um, mm. It's embedded from the beginning. I don't think it'll ever change. I just think comedy will help you deal with it, process it, laugh mm. about it, and not take certain conversations so serious. Mm. But I don't think it'll ever change because if you look at the history, Mm. I'm 40 now. That's all I know. Everything mm. been drilled to me about race since the beginning. Mm. I mean, even in our schools, you're rather teach me about 1912 mm. than prepare me for the future. Mm. In history, I had to learn I mean, everything that happened history. before me. What mm. about you didn't teach you're, me? You always what? learned about slavery. You always learning about the problems and the issues mm -hmm. and, and the differences and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you you, mm. you taught me everything in my past and never and didn't set me up for my future. Mm. So I don't think it'll it'll ever change. Mm. I just think that comedy will evolve and help you deal with those conversations. Uh, what, 
like that coping mechanism. Mm, like yeah. right now, I, if if something is serious going going on, I'd feel more comfortable using my sense of humor to talk to you. Mm, mm, okay. Uh, so I don't think it'll ever go anywhere. I don't think it'll. No, it, it won't because it, it didn't start with comedy. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I think that's that's an incredibly um, honest, you know answer <laughs> do, you, do you ever do you remember your first joke oh man my first jokes I, I like i said i started off as a writer so i really just wrote short stories that would be funny i grew up listening to dolomite re repeating and i would take like dolomite signified monkey and change the words and make it into my own words mm -hmm. um but to be honest with you my first joke was uh, your daddy was a joke. <laughs> that was like when I first started. I I called my mom, mm. and and that's what she said. And I incorporated that, and mm. uh, it just jumped. It, it and it that's like been my favorite. I did that joke on the show as a special request for somebody that heard it ten years ago. Mm. It was still got <laughs> it's still got a laugh. I imagine they, they still get a laugh out of it every time because I. I could take the same joke and deliver it in ten different ways. Mm. Yeah. So, so I, I definitely one of my first jokes. Mm. Um, but yeah, that that I grew up as a writer. Like I, I didn't I I wanted to be a comedic writer. That's mm. what I wanted to be. Mm. But then you write for people, and they don't they don't do it perform it with the same passion that you wrote it. Mm. Cool. So I start, so I did it myself. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I must say, I really love your style of comedy. I love your, you've got this very, you know, I've talked about, I spoke to um, a singer the other day and she had a very chilled way, the way she sung songs. It was so beautiful and mm -hmm. it was calm and everything else. And it, you just, I, I mean, it's like, I don't know if you're telling a joke. Like you just, you just, I don't know, it's just like strange the way you come across. <laughs> you're like, you're, you're like just a cool guy in the room. Do you know what I mean? He's just like, you know, a cool guy in the room. He throws out a little line once in a while and it's like, but it's like we're all waiting for you to say something, but you're controlling the whole room. You know what you're doing. It's amazing. It's a, you know, to have that kind I of appreciate it. A lot of work, brother. A lot, yeah, lot to have that kind of confidence, man. man. You know, everyone's got watching. <laughs> you. I've been like, and, I, this <laughs> and I'm usually quiet before a show. Everybody mm. be like, why? what? And, and people tell me, like, I was not expecting that. Mm. You come, mm. I'm usually quiet and chill. Mm. I think that side comes from my mom. Because my mom, she would just be so serious and hit you with a one-liner. Mm. And I, I, with my comedy, uh, I, I think, like, before she passed away, I, I would use her her heavily in my sets. Mm. Uh, because that was my, that, that's who I called to run new jokes by, was my mom. And uh, just with my delivery, I've learned the difference in the culture. So when I, because I'm, I'm naturally a storyteller. Mm, okay. But most black audience, they don't have the patience for a story. Yeah. Mm. The white, the white audience, they will listen to mm. a story from A to Z. Mm -hmm. So I learned that from Bill Cosby. I studied him. I studied the quick quickness in the one liners of Red Fox, the mm. animations of the the Cat Williams and the and the and the Kevin Hart's, and I just put it all together. Mm. The realness of Bernie Mac. The seriousness of what, what got him through. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just put it all in, in, in one and I made it my own style. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So you never know what you're going to get when you get with me. You get through the same show, it's going to be different every time. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So, well, but we're going to run out of time. It's on Zoom. So we only have about a few minutes to go. All right. So we have okay. to rush through, some, rush through some stuff, okay, quickly. So I'm going to ask you on a scale to, of one to 10, I'm going to just rate these comedians that I mentioned, the scale of one to 10, okay? Are you trying to get me in trouble? Let's go. Let's it's go. It's fine. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Cat, Cat Williams. Nine. Okay. Chris Rock. Chris Rock. I give him about, for me, seven. Okay. Richard Pryor. Richard Pryor, I give him a nine. Okay. Oh, good. Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy, eight. Mm. Eddie, I hope you're listening to that. You've got work to do. <laughs> Jim, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey, I'm gonna give my man a nine point five. <laughs> oh wow, he's, he's crazy! Yeah, yeah. Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle. He go, he gonna get a nine in my book. 
Okay, good, good, good. Will Farrell. Will Farrell. It's more. I'm gonna give him about seven. Uh, okay. I'm gonna give him mm. about seven. <laughs> okay, he's one of my he's one of my favorite comedians, but no, all good. Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah, I give him an eight. Okay. Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart, man, listen, I'm gonna get Kevin by seven, seven and a half. Okay. Tracy Morgan. Two. Okay. <laughs> all right, great, very great. Fabulous, fabulous. <laughs> all, right, all right. Um, yeah. One big question though. I think it's a question everyone's wanna hear. Should we forgive Will Smith? Yes, we should. Hmm. I mean, this man has been a pillar of perfection in the black community hmm. for how many decades? He's got your he's your namesake as well. Come on, Will Smith. Uh, he... You know what? I, I feel like Chris Rock grew up in the hood. He hmm. should have never let that dude got that close to him in the first place. Hmm. I ain't about to let nobody watch. <laughs> But now, he's he's his, all his arms aside, up, mate. Ready for yeah. it. He's never expected it. Like all seriousness aside, mm. I think definitely we should forgive him. Like you know, as a black man, the hardest thing you can do is apologize. Mm. It is so hard for a black man to apologize. This man has apologized every way he knows how. Mm. It's his one mistake that he's made in my eye. Like mm. how many mistakes have we made as humans? Mm. Yeah. You out here fighting your own family. Mm. So, you know what I'm saying? I yeah. say we should forgive him. Brilliant. Will Speed, thank you so much. An absolute pleasure. Thank you for doing this interview for ClusterView.com. Appreciate you, man. And we're going to check your you know, your comedy. I want to put some of it in this, okay? If I can do that, I, I will. Appreciate it. it. I appreciate thank it. You for yeah, thank Will you for the time, man. Comedy. All my love to you. Stay strong. Thank Be you, well. brother. God you bless, man. Love to Darren Darby for setting this up. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.